With choice comes optimism about possibilities for the future. And with choice comes responsibility and the ability to hold other people accountable for their behavior. Finally, if the mind is completely separate from the body, that holds out the hope that the mind can survive the death of the body, an idea whose emotional appeal I think is all too obvious. Uh, like the other two doctrines, the ghost in the machine has had a widespread influence. Freedom, dignity, and responsibility are often seen as incompatible with a biological view of the mind, which is commonly condemned as being reductionist or determinist. Now, no one really knows what these words mean, but everyone knows that there's something bad. <laughs> uh, we see it in the stem cell debate, where uh, a number of the theologians who weighed in uh, with uh, President Bush uh, the summer before last uh, couched the issue in terms of when insolment takes place, which means that perhaps the most promising medical technology of the 21st century is debated in terms of when the ghost first enters the machine. And we see it even in, in uh, everyday thinking and speech, as when we talk about John's brain, which seems to presuppose some entity, John, that's separate from the brain that it owns. Uh, and when journalists speculate about brain transplants, whereas in fact they should really uh, discuss body transplants, because as the philosopher Dan Dennett once pointed out, this is the one such operation in which it's better to be the donor than the recipient. <laughs> Now, there's a big problem with a blank slate, um, and that is blank slates don't do anything. They would just sit there forever receiving inscriptions unless they had something uh, in, t in their organization that actively recombined the inscriptions on the slate and used them in pursuit of certain goals. No one denies the importance of learning, socialization, and culture. Only a madman would say everything is in the genes and that our experience doesn't count. The question, though, is what are we born with that allows us to learn and that allows experience to leave its trace on future uh, behavior? When Locke uh, said there is nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses, I think the perfect reply came from Leibniz when he said, except for the intellect itself. Uh, and indeed, it's this recognition that has led to a number of threats to the blank slate from contemporary sciences that are studying the human mind. For example, my own field, cognitive science, has underscored that you need innate mechanisms to do the learning to begin with, and that these innate mechanisms uh, are complex and multiple. Uh, cognitive scientists have argued uh, that uh, babies are born with some concept of an object and of causation that we have a number sense, a number of spatial representations that allow the brain to keep track of the environment and of objects in it, a theory of mind or intuitive psychology by which we infer the mental states of other people when we interact with them, and uh, a language instinct that allows us to communicate our thoughts, and executive systems of the frontal lobes which receive information from many parts of the brain and that affect decisions that the rest of the brain and body carry out. Evolutionary psychology has uh, challenged the blank slate by showing that beneath all of the cultural variation that anthropologists have trumpeted for the last hundred years, there's also a bedrock of universals, emotions and behavior patterns that are shared by all human beings uh, across the world's 6,000 cultures. Recently, the anthropologist Donald Brown has cataloged them. Uh, he's found a good 300 <laughs> universals, everything from uh, aesthetics, affection, and ambivalence, uh, all the way down to verbs, violence, vowels, weaning, weapons, and attempts to control the weather. <laughs> Evolutionary psychology has undermined the blank slate in another way by showing that many human drives uh, can't be seen as ways in which people calculate what's best for them in their own day-to-day uh, lo -day lives, but rather can only be understood as adaptations to an ancestral environment in which we evolved, which may not be relevant to our happiness and well-being today. An obvious example is our taste for sugar, salt, and fat, which has uh, obvious uh, health consequences, as many of us eat ourselves into an early grave with too much junk food. Uh, but this, it's perfectly understandable why we have those tastes. Those are um, 
precious nutrients, and in an environment in which they were in short supply, a taste for them would have been adaptive. Now that we can crank out mass quantities of the stuff, our taste for them hasn't changed, and uh, that does us more uh, harm than good. A thirst for revenge and a willingness to defend your interests with uh, violent defenses of one's honor uh, lead to a great deal of unnecessary suffering, vendettas, blood feuds, uh, cycles of revenge, and so on, but were necessary in an, a world in which you couldn't dial 911 to get Leviathan to show up to settle your scores for you. And a reputation for toughness was one's own def only defense against being a uh, punching bag. And less obvious um, example is our desire for attractive mates. Now, a number of years ago, the humorist Fran Lebowitz made a very insightful observation about human psychology. She said, people who marry someone that they're attracted to are making a terrible mistake. You really should marry your best friend. You like your best friend more than you're likely to like anyone that you happen to be physically attracted to. You don't pick your best friend because they have a cute nose. But that's all you're doing when you're getting married. You're saying, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you because of your lower lip. <laughs> now, this is a puzzle, and I th think the uh, solution to it is demonstrations that uh, many of the uh, anatomical signs of beauty are, in fact, uh, advertisements of health, fertility, and fitness. And in being attracted to people with that facial geometry, we're maximizing the chances that our genes will combine with the best uh, other genes. Neuroscience has shown that there's a complex genetic patterning uh, to the brain, although uh, it's obvious that the brain has a great deal of plasticity, which is necessary for us to learn and remember, um, there's also a great deal of complex structure that's laid out in the course of um, development in utero. This is a diagram of the primate visual system. It's not an oil refinery. Um, comprised of some 50 distinct areas interconnected in precise ways. And it's not just the overall cabling of the brain that is partly under uh, genetic control during development, but some of the fine structure that makes one brain different from another. Here's a diagram from a recent study by the neurobiologist uh, Paul Thompson and his colleagues at UCLA, in which they measured using MRI the distribution of gray matter in different parts of the brain of a large sample of people. And they tested for correlations between amounts of brain matter in different parts of the cortex and plotted them in false color so that uh, purple represents uh, zero correlation and uh, colors that differ from uh, purple that are green and yellow and pink and so on represent significant correlations. Now if you pair people at random, by definition the correlations are zero and here you see in a left view of the brain, right view of the brain, top view of the brain, what zero correlation looks like. This is what happens when a pair of people share half their genes, namely fraternal twins. You can see that large amounts of the brain uh, show correlations from one twin to another. And this is what happens when you share all your genes. Um, there are areas with very strong correlations and virtually and large parts of the brain show some correlation showing, suggesting that the shared genes build brains that are more similar. And it's likely that these aren't just um, anatomical curly cues like your earlobes or your fingerprints, but have functional consequences. Uh, nicely summed up in this cartoon, also from the New Yorker, by uh, Chaz Adams. Uh, separated at birth, the Malifert twins meet accidentally. <laughs> now, this is only um, somewhat of an exaggeration. Studies of identical twins who were separated at birth and then are tested in adulthood show that they often have astonishing similarities. Uh, my favorite example being the uh, twins, one of whom was brought up in, as a Catholic in a Nazi family in Germany. The other was brought up uh, as a Jew in a family in Trinidad. Nonetheless, when they met each other as adults, it turned out that both of them kept rubber bands around their wrist. Both of them dipped buttered toast in coffee. Both of them flushed the toilet both before using it and after using it. And both of them liked to sneeze in crowded elevators to watch everyone jump. <laughs> Now, these admittedly are anecdotes, but they're never 
they've never been documented in any pair of fraternal twins separated at birth and reunited in adulthood, and they're corroborated by uh, the best measuring instruments known to psychology. Uh, that is, that there are um, enormous similarities among twins reared apart, which leads to what's sometimes called the first law of behavioral genetics, which is that all behavioral traits are partially heritable, although uh, nowhere near completely. The noble savage has also uh, come under attack from uh, studies of, uh, of mind, brain, and behavior. Behavioral genetics has shown that among the traits that are heritable are antagonism, uh, unconscientiousness, tendencies towards violent crime, and psychopathy. Neuroscience has identified brain mechanisms uh, in, among primates that are associated with aggression. Evolutionary psychology and anthropology have underscored the ubiquity of conflict in human societies, just as we see elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Now here is a, a diagram of uh, a graph of the percentage of male deaths due to warfare in a variety of societies. That is, if you're a male, what are the chances that you will die at the hands of some other man as opposed to dying uh, peaceably in your bed or by any other uh, me way? Uh, the red bars are from a variety of pre-state societies, hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticultural societies in the New Guinea highlands and the Amazon rainforest, and they range from about 10% to uh, almost 60%. The tiny little blue bar at the lower left uh, represents the United States and Europe in the 20th century and includes the statistics from both world wars. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to man in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. <laughs> now what about our own society where we enjoy this uh, relatively low uh, rate of death by violence? Well, um, here's a revealing question, and I'll, I'll pose it to you, and I beg you not to answer aloud, but keep the answer to yourself. H have you ever thought about killing someone? Okay, please don't answer. Well, psychologists are busybodies, and they have asked this question of large samples of people, and here's a typical result. Uh, about a third of men and 15% of women frequently think about killing people they don't like. <laughs> And about three quarters of men and more than 60% of women at least occasionally think about killing people they don't like. And many of you are probably thinking, yeah, and the rest are liars. <laughs> the ghost in the machine has also uh, come under uh, attack. A cognitive science has shown that intelligence uh, doesn't require some ghostly substance. Uh, it's not some act of magic, but it can be explained in mechanistic terms. That one can think of beliefs as a kind of information, thinking as a form of computation, not the kind of computation that your Macintosh does, but rather a form of presumably analog, uh, parallel, fuzzy computation, but computation nonetheless and that emotions can be understood as mechanisms of feedback and control, uh, a little bit like your, uh, like your thermostat. Artificial intelligence has underscored that uh, intelligence is, can be understood as a physical process by building uh, computers and robots that can uh, do intelligent things, the most famous example being the defeat of the world chess champion Garry Kasparov by the program Deep Blue uh, six years ago. Uh, neuroscience has undermined the ghost in the machine through what Francis Crick called the astonishing hypothesis in his book of, of that title. The hypothesis that all of our thoughts and feelings, all of our desires and joys and uh, aches and passions consist of the physiological activity of the tissues of the brain. And astonishing though this hypothesis may be, uh, there's a great deal of evidence that it's uh, true. We know that every form of mental activity gives off electrical signals that we can now detect, and moreover that by sending an electrical current into the brain, the person can undergo a vivid lifelike uh, experience. We know that the uh, brain is a, a, a chemical organ and that uh, administrations of chemicals, such as in uh, drugs, can change perception, thought, and uh, mood. Uh, in surgery, uh, if a surgeon severs the corpus callosum joining the two cerebral hemispheres, then you've got two consciousnesses taking place within one skull as if the soul could be bisected with a knife. When a brain is damaged by uh, strokes and other uh, 
diseases, a part of the person can uh, vanish. We know that the brain has a staggering complexity, 100 billion neurons interconnected by 100 trillion synapses, which is fully 